Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. Most of us have seen movies or television shows where sharks have been portrayed as marauders who prey on unsuspecting swimmers or smaller fish in the sea. But many Wild Kingdom episodes illustrate how sharks and other predators are an important part of the food chain in our underwater world. Oceans cover 70% of our planet, yet we still have much to learn about this important ecosystem. Modern technology has enhanced our ability to study the oceans with minimal disruption to their habitat. Human involvement and in recent legislation to protect underwater creatures allow for the resurgence of these many species. There's more good news to come in the Wild Kingdom, so sit back and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. In the wild kingdom beneath the sea, the shark is an aggressive killer, posing a constant threat to those who go exploring the reef. From Chicago's famed Lincoln Park Zoo, here is Marlon Perkins to lead us in exploring the reef. Hello, welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. In our ventures into the various parts of the Wild Kingdom, we've made most of our investigations on the land. That's because you can travel hundreds of miles across the land, but without specialized equipment such as this, you couldn't travel even a hundred feet below the surface of the ocean. It isn't surprising, therefore, that even though three-fourths of our Earth's surface is covered by water, that's the part of the Wild Kingdom that has had the least exploration. But there are certain places that have given us glimpses into this watery world. These are the coral islands and the nearby reefs. One of the most remarkable of these coral islands is a part of Bimini in the Bahamas. In these warm, clear, protected waters, we find an enormous variety of marine life concentrated in one place. So Bimini is an excellent place for investigating some of the riddles and mysteries of the sea. That's why the world-famous Lerner Marine Laboratory was located on the island by Michael Lerner. Operated by the American Museum of Natural History, the laboratory attracts scientists from all over the world who come to study, observe, and experiment. For instance, I was interested in the work being done by Dr. Lloyd Claff. He was studying the complicated mechanism that enables a fish to inflate and deflate its air bladder and so hover in the water while expending little or no energy. Under the guidance of Dr. Robert Mathewson, director of the Lerner Laboratory, many of the staff studies involve animal behavior. In a variety of tanks and pens, conditions can be controlled and animals can be studied in detail over a long period of time, much more closely than would be possible in the open sea. Some of the animals, in fact, become quite tame. Where else would you let a stingray take food directly from your hand? In one of the other pens, feeding habits were under observation, with special attention being given to the feeding frenzy that develops among trigger fish. In still another pen, quite a different experiment was going on. This program grew out of the chance observation that baby sea turtles seemed to be attracted to the color red. Being a little skeptical, I tried it myself. One of the balloons I'm holding here is red. The other is blue. Notice how the turtles come to the red balloon. No one knows yet the significance of this attraction to the color red, but it's the type of clue men follow in seeking additional knowledge about the ways of life in the sea. After observing some of the experimental work going on in the Lerner Laboratory, Jim and I set out on our own to explore the waters of Bimini. A giant ray scooted ahead of our boat. Our 
destination was a mangrove swamp where a tangle of tree roots accumulates debris and soil until a new island is formed. Jim used a glass bottom viewing bucket to get a clear view beneath the surface. Clear view is right. It's almost like looking into an aquarium. Quiet waters like these are favorite haunts of the spiny sea urchin. The movable spines protect them from most of their enemies, but not from the queen trigger fish. In one of the deeper holes, I watched a sea urchin trying to wedge itself between the rocks, but the queen trigger kept pulling it back into the open. Finally, she succeeded in dropping it on its back. Then she skillfully attacked the underside with her powerful jaws and ripped the urchin out of its shell. With a snorkel and face mask, the range of vision below the water is greatly extended. It's really amazing the variety of fish that you encounter in a short time. One of the oddest of all is the kubiu with its tall sail-like fin. These are grunts. To us, it may look like they're kissing, but to a grunt, it's more than likely that it's a warning notice that one has entered the other's territory. I was particularly fascinated with the protective devices I saw. The burfish, for instance, like the sea urchin, is protected by sharp spines, much as a porcupine is. On the other hand, the horned cowfish is armored after the manner of a tortoise. It moves through the water more by rowing than swimming. Of course, many sea animals protect themselves by hiding. The jawfish not only digs a burrow, but lines it with stones. I happened upon two jawfish that had dug their burrows too close together and were engaged in a territorial dispute. To drive out its rival, one jawfish set out to steal the stones around the other's doorway and use them to build up its own nest. The second jawfish wasn't about to give up without a fight, so fight they did. Finally, the first jawfish drove the other from its burrow and thereby established claim to this tiny section of ocean floor. While there are many dangerous animals in the wild kingdom, most won't bother man unless man bothers them. Sharks are an exception. Sharks are one of the very few animals that will attack man without provocation. The best place to study sharks is again Bimini. Here we can take advantage of the experimental shark pens built by the Office of Naval Research at the Lerner Marine Laboratory. Here they approximate conditions found in the open sea, for sharks that is. For us, there was the safety of a stout observation cage. was lowered into the water near the cage and almost instantly the lemon sharks attacked. Like most people, I suppose, I'd always thought sharks rolled onto their sides when they attacked. But here we could see quite clearly that they don't. Instead, they use their large pectoral fins like wing flaps to check their forward speed. And with jaws wide open, they anchor their teeth in deep. Then, vigorously shaking their bodies from side to side, they back away, tearing off from 10 to 15 pounds of flesh in a bite.
The sharks we saw in these pens were being collected for studies being made by Dr. Perry W. Gilbert of the Department of Zoology of Cornell University. Dr. Gilbert is also the chairman of the shark research panel of the American Institute of Biological Science, coordinating uh, shark investigations from all parts of the world. This must be a pretty fascinating activity. It certainly is, Marlon. We have a number of projects underway. One deals with the maintenance of a file on shark attacks as they occur anywhere in the world. Dr. Leonard P. Schultz of the U.S. National Museum heads up this file. We're attempting to learn more about the major movements of sharks and migrations in different parts of the world. And Stuart Springer of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is about to initiate a shark tagging program. And then we have numerous programs underway at the Lerner Marine Laboratory dealing with the sense organs and behavior patterns of sharks. All in all, Marlin, we're learning a lot about a very fascinating group of fishes. You know, from the looks of this jaw of a tiger shark, it's pretty obvious that they're well equipped for attacking. Look at that battery of teeth. Yes, and for every functional outer tooth, there's a reserve supply back of it. Ready to roll up into position and take the place of the functional tooth when it's worn off. From looking at these, there's no question about their ability to do damage with their teeth. I don't know about Marlin, but when I found myself swimming off Bimini, I began to think a little bit about this question of just how dangerous sharks are. Well, there are some that are dangerous. You're quite right, Jim. But of the some 250 species of sharks known today, only 25 to 30 species have been implicated in attacks on man. Didn't uh, most of the research for shark repellents develop during World War II? Yes, Marlin, that's right. In this country, it did. As a result of attacks on Navy and Air Force personnel, a crash program was instituted at Woods Hole back in 1942 to find a more effective shark repellent. Some useful results were achieved in this program, but we have not by any means found the complete answer to this shark hazard problem. We heard a lot about one of them at Lerner Laboratory, and that was the experiment with a bubble curtain. Yes, that's right, Jim. A couple of years ago, you recall there were some serious attacks along the Atlantic coast, and resort owners thought that perhaps a curtain of air bubbles off the shore would keep sharks away from swimmers. This idea seemed worth testing, and so we did. The idea is to use an air compressor attached to a rubber hose that is perforated. And as the compressor is turned on, bubbles of air come up through the perforations and present a wall or screen supposedly impervious to sharks. As you can see, these tiger sharks, one of the most common dangerous sharks in the Caribbean area, are promiscuously swimming back and forth through that bubble curtain. It had no effect on them whatsoever. Perry, does this shark repellent developed during World War II really work? Well, Marlon, I'm sure under many conditions it does work. As you know, it's called shark chaser. Yeah. It's composed of nigrosine dye and copper acetate. We were interested in testing the relative effectiveness of these two ingredients. When we tested the copper acetate alone, we found that it did not repel any species of shark with which we worked. So we turned to the nigrosine dye and tested it alone. First, we pumped ordinary seawater down a tube so that it spilled out right beside the shark's food. This was to test the effect of water turbulence. During this period, the sharks actively fed on the bait. Then we injected the nigrosine dye into the water. We were pumping down the tube. And the lemon sharks moved away. You mean just the dye alone watered them off without any other chemical? That's right, Marlin. It worked quite well on lemon sharks and on several other species with which we worked. This can be shown more clearly in the circular pool. Ordinarily in this pool, a shark will keep swimming around the circumference. Now let's put an open bottle of nigrosine dye in the water at the edge of the pool and see what happens. The shark veers away to avoid it. 
As the dye spreads in the water, the shark continues to restrict his movements to those parts that are still clear. So certainly we can say that the dye has some effectiveness as a repellent for lemon sharks. We still haven't found a repellent that is 100% effective, nor have we found any repellent that functions when sharks are really excited and in a so-called feeding frenzy. Uh, meanwhile, Perry, what can a person really do to protect themselves in shark-infested waters? Well, it's always a good idea, Marlin, to swim with a companion. Mm -hmm. If dangerous sharks are spotted, it would be wise to get out of the water. It's also quite wise not to enter the water if you have a bleeding wound, for we know uh, sharks are attracted to fresh blood. If you're a spear fisherman, you should get rid of speared fish as quickly as possible. And while one should not be unduly alarmed about the possibility of shark attack, one should be prudent in their behavior with them. In short, one should not molest them or grab them by the tail. Yeah. One should, in short, adopt a sensible attitude towards sharks. Adopting a sensible attitude is sound advice for protecting yourself against any possible hazard. When we explore the land areas of the Wild Kingdom, we often find the rarest animals in the most inaccessible places, in the farthest reaches of the desert, in the darkest part of the forest. But when we set out to explore the sea, we find some of its most interesting inhabitants concentrated right around the coral reef. With scuba gear, we can go beneath the turbulent surface of the sea into the calm, silent world below. It's a world which knows nothing of man and has no fear of him. So we're able to move freely about among the natural-born swimmers. On every hand, I encountered living fossils. Jellyfish just like these have been rhythmically swimming these seas for 600 million years. Their tentacles carry stinging cells so powerful that they can paralyze and kill fish as large as themselves. The squid, too, dates from prehistoric times and is responsible for many an ancient mariner's story about sea monsters. The mollusk also has ancestors reaching far back in time. It darts about from place to place, pausing only long enough to strain the food out of the water. The graceful rays came along much later. One thing in particular I was hunting for was the famous Portuguese man of war. And I found one. This amazing creature is not really an animal at all. It's a colony of several hundred animals. And the colony is made up of at least four different kinds of animals, each kind performing a different function. One providing flotation, another reproducing their kind, a third protecting the colony with poisonous tentacles that may reach a length of as much as 50 feet, a fourth finding food with similar tentacles that capture fish, like this Sergeant Major fish. Kingdom, the Portuguese man of war is truly unique. I saw some pretty odd creatures myself. The trumpet fish, for instance. It floats head down, pretending to be just another stalk of eelgrass. This camouflage is so good that it's easy for him to catch a small fish swimming by. There was a puffer fish that protects itself by swelling its body with water. With quills standing straight out, it has a very effective defense against any attacker. The hermit crab lacks effective protection of its own, so it moves into an empty shell vacated by the original owner.
Like the animals of the land, animals of the sea live by the natural law of eat and be eaten. Small fish are natural prey for larger fish, such as this giant grouper. One of the best equipped of the nautical fishermen is appropriately named the angler fish. Well camouflaged, it's also supplied with a bony filament which it extends from its head to serve as a fishing pole. At the end of the pole, there's a fleshy part that vibrates and looks for all the world like a live worm. This is the bait. Where's the taker? Watch closely now. Lacking camouflage, this crab seeks to hide from its enemies by burying itself in the sand. Unluckily for the crab, at about the same time I happened along, so did a queen triggerfish, and she knew where to look for a meal. It's no trick for her to blow away the protecting sand. The crab, of course, puts up a fight. The strategy of the queen triggerfish is to evade the crab's powerful claws while crippling it by biting off an arm. The fish has the advantage of mobility, and once the crab loses an arm, its further struggles are in vain. animal preys on creatures smaller than itself. Near the top of the pyramid are the real killers of the sea, the sharks. Another killer of the sea is the barracuda. It might seem that the continuously raging battle for survival, the endless killing of animal by animal, would serve to decimate the population of the sea. Nature's answer to that problem lies in a scale of reproduction far more extravagant than we find in any other part of the wild kingdom. Jim, with sights like that, it's no wonder that skin diving has become such a popular sport. Well, it's certainly an exciting way to travel through the wild kingdom. Easy, too, if you know what you're doing and take the proper precautions. Well, there's another kind of precaution you wanted to mention, isn't there, Marlon? Yes, as a matter of fact, there is. It's the precaution of protection. Today, the eyes of the world are turned outward, and the launching of satellites has become routine and commonplace. Yet, even as we embark upon these far journeys to unlock the secrets of other planets, there is much yet to be learned about our own planet. Three-fourths of the Earth's surface is water, and in the sea are depths which could easily swallow our highest mountains. We know some of what lives in these depths, but much remains a mystery. With each investigation, we'll know more. But so far, we've barely scratched the surface of the wild kingdom of the sea. Yeah. <laughs>